right. So let's kick off the panel discussion. Um, maybe by just introducing the subject matter of this discussion. So this panel is about fairness in personalization, the role of transparency, user control, and the balance between fundamental rights. And I really like it uh, because actually um, it tells me a lot intuitively, but if I really go into these terms, I'm quickly lost. Uh, even I've been working with these terms since uh, at least 15 years. So um, I would grab this, this uh, discussion here to understand it uh, a little bit better and to understand their meaning in practice. So uh, just to give you a glimpse, I mean fairness is such a broad principle. Actually, for the first 15 years of my academic career, I, I mean, I understood it intuitively. But I had no idea what this actually means uh, in, in, in legal terms. So, so what does it actually say? What does fairness require from regulation uh, addresses to do? And the same is a little bit the case with the term personalization, because um, of course I knew that uh, we are, the whole internet economy is driven by personalized advertising. I mean, this was um, a matter of the fact, what even I as a lawyer understood. Uh, but um, I was quite naive um, with respect to the fact that personalization of internet content is actually much, much broader. So I think nowadays, the whole internet is about being personalized, and I mean this has many, many, many effects on how we, um, well, uh, can act within the internet and also for the societal order um, overall. So many um, big uh, concepts and observations of facts here. And then it gets even, uh, well, more specific with the role of transparency and user control, and then even the balance between fundamental rights. And I would say we start now simply by unfolding this complexity uh, step by step, um, yeah, by asking, yeah, starting uh, with quick questions to um, some specific terms. And I propose to start with the lawyer, um, Vera, so um, you are a partner in the regulatory team of Hengele Müller. It's a very famous law, uh, law firm, I think also uh, abroad. Uh, based in Düsseldorf, you. Um, so, and you advise international companies on all aspects of public and regulatory law with a particular focus on data protection. Uh, so your um, long-standing experience covers business model compliance, data protection and MA tr uh, transaction, internal investigations, regulatory proceedings and interna international litigation, as well as admi administrative fines. So I think um, you know a lot uh, with respect to uh, what the tra transparency uh, fairness principle in the GDPR actually means. So how do you understand it? And do you have some cases, for example, really from practice, where this principle has uh, played a role? Thank you very much, Max. So um, yes, indeed, I would like to introduce the fairness principle in the GDPR. And um, what does fairness mean in the GDPR? I think fairness, what is fairness, what is fair, everybody has a certain you know, natural understanding of this term, in particular also of what is not fair. Yeah? So I briefly discussed this with my kids who are very much into football. And of course, in, this, in the sports, um, the principle of fairness is very well known and acknowledged. You need to respect the rules. You need to, um, to, be, to be respectful, not discriminating against others. That's very, uh, very uh, common uh, and uh, a concept and easily understood. Uh, in the legal world, um, it's uh, perhaps less clear. And in the, in the GDPR, the term of fairness or fair processing is one of the principles of data processing. And it's laid out in Article 5 in the first principle. Yes, So the controller needs to do fair as well as transparent and lawful processing. So it's in this. Um, set of three principles, one of the first principles that uh, the GDPR refers to. Transparency, fairness, and lawfulness always goes together. And this is, I think, uh, my immediate observation. 
while transparency and also lawfulness is then further detailed in some, some later articles, for example, lawfulness in Article 6 and 9 and transparency in Article 13, 14 and also other areas of the GDPR, the principle of fairness is not further specified, but it appears here and there in combination with other principles. Yeah, for example, in Article 13 and 14, where you discuss the transparency, the information rights of, of individuals, um, in order for processing to be fair, certain information need to be given. Yeah, so the, 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 the fairness complements uh, the transparency uh, principle and information rights and also in the in the lawfulness articles um, there's reference to this fairness principles in the recitals of the gdpr fairness is also mentioned it's even mentioned uh, explicitly in uh, recital 39 but also there no uh, further explanation is given no definition yeah and also there it's combined with the transparency and lawfulness uh, principle and also the principle of purpose limitation. So this leads people to interpret this principle um, on the one hand as a self-standing principle, as it is explicitly mentioned in Article 5, it needs to be more than transparency and more than lawfulness. However, um, it is um, more used to help interpreting what the transparency and lawfulness and purpose limitation principles mean rather than that it has a, a self-standing uh, um, importance. Um, however, uh, I think um, we also need to, when interpreting the GDPR, we need to take into account that the fairness principle is also derived from the European uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights. And there, um, it's an overarching principle, yeah? So personal data need to be treated, need to be processed fairly. And this is, um, and the term fair there is used like in other fundamental rights, um, like for example, the right for a fair trial, yeah, fair justice, or also fair administrative proceedings. So really quite an important principle, but which needs to be then further specified and also interpreted. Um, so let me conclude um, by saying that the principle of fairness, in my opinion, helps to interpret the GDPR. It has related concepts in the GDPR like, you know, appropriateness, adequacy, also risk. Um, so it is one of the principles that shows that none of the rights and obligations in the GDPR is absolute but needs to be balanced. I think the fairness shows that um, that you need to bring the rights of different people and different players in the GDPR, the controller, but also the data subjects um, into balance. Yeah, you need to balance their rights and interests and the fairness principle sort of overarches these, um, these obligations. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so before I jump into that, because of course I have a pile of uh, further uh, deepening questions, um, I would um, go further uh, with Cecilia. Uh, because, um, so we just go to the next term, because it's not only here at this panel about um, fairness, uh, but it's about fairness and personalization. So, and I heard that uh, at Meta, Cecilia, you work for Meta, um, at Meta, there, it's a lot about uh, personalization. Uh, so I think it's a good question to ask uh, Cecilia um, what uh, personalization actually means within the Meta universe. Um, and how this is actually um, interrelated uh, to the fairness principle, in your opinion. And just to give you a, brim, uh, a glimpse, uh, I'm sorry, Cecilia, but I would like to um, tell a little bit more about uh, your position and your experience, because I think it's quite uh, uh, impressive. So Cecilia is uh, right now um, um, the EMEA uh, Privacy Policy Director at Meta uh, since March 2019, so since um, more than two years. And before that, um, you have worked um, or served uh, four years um, as a European Privacy Officer Lead of Pfizer. 
Uh, and before that, you even worked 18 years in a re reputed Spanish law firm, uh, leading the data protection, IT, and e-commerce areas of practice, as well as the um, Latin America Data Protection Working Group. So you are further a member of the Spanish Royal um, Academy of Jurisprudence and legislation in the section of the law and te uh, technologies of the information and the knowledge. And with that background, I'm really curious, um, so with your experience, what you have to say about fairness and personalization uh, at Meta. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for being here with uh, us today. I will maybe uh, start with something more, because we jump immediately, and you mentioned when you were uh, addressing what we are going to speak today, on personalized ads. However, personalization is something that is broader than ads. It's a concept that I think it deserves that we take some time. And since I have been in the field for a long time, uh, I have been working extensively in the financial sector. And at the time, actually what they were looking was personalized banking services, because they were looking for addressing their services to the customers in a manner that the customers were feeling special, that were feeling that they were addressing their needs. And then I was very much working with health-related data, genetic data first, and then other kinds of, of data that lead me to my next experience at Pfizer. And one of the aspirations that we can see in the healthcare sector is actually to have personalized medicines and to have personalized therapies, because this is the best way in which we can get. Actually, these are other kind of needs. In this case, they are health needs, but this is the way in which we may have a better healthcare. And we can go on and on, but this is not something that is particular, let's say, to the internet. The only thing is that the internet, or the way in which we do now uh, business, and not only for uh, private organization, but also for public organizations, we feel the need to have access to the persons that, to which is our natural audience regarding the activities that we are doing. And this is something that encompasses, I think, many sectors of activity. Even there are new professions, the personal shopper. So the personalization is really very much present in, in many of the things that, that we do. And as I mentioned, one of the main elements that are behind is to be able to explain what you do in an efficient manner and therefore to be able to reach out what is this natural audience with respect to the messages that you want to have. And it doesn't matter whether you are a charity, you're a, a public administration, or you are meta. It is always the same goal that, 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 that you have. Let me just share with you, I will need now to, to take some support here because uh, my brain is not that good this morning in order to retain certain percentages that I think are relevant for us. These are studies that have been made uh, externally, so not funded by Meta, uh, not even when I was at Meta <laughs> and some of them. One is the Harvard Business Review, and they were saying that 38% increase in productive revenue when customers receive transparent ads based on their activity on a site. This was particularly focused on ads. Another one, Salesforce. This is not necessarily on ads. They say 70% of consumers say a company's understanding of their personal need influences their loyalty. Another one, Accenture. 91% of consumers say that they are more likely to shop with brands that provide offers and recommendations that are relevant to them. And then I may cite a meta-commissioned report uh, through a third party in 2020 that was examining a specific study on how the apps and technologies of Facebook across 15 European Union markets were helping them in any respect regarding these personalized elements. And they were saying that the Facebook apps and technologies were generating sales corresponding to 208 billion euros in economy activity in the year that they were studying, and that this was translated into an estimate of 3 million jobs. I just want to share all of this because these are reports with respect to why personalization matters in general to organizations, not only to Meta, and not only with respect to the personalized ads, that of course personalized ads also forms part of this personalization. Because when you have a business or you have an activity, actually you are not going to survive or you are not going even to grow if you are not able to sell your products or to explain your messages. And this is the whole purpose of advertising. And that's why personalized ads have been so important 
because this is a way in which you get to reach this potential audience that will be interested in what you have to say. Let me now go into the question that what Meta does with respect to do personalization. The personalization, so if you read the terms and conditions or the terms of use of Meta, that is where any company puts what is the contract or the value proposition that they are offering, what you are going to find is a service that has three main features. The personalization, the free in the sense that the users are not those who are paying for accessing the service, it is paid through the advertisers, and the global, in the sense that it is a service that enables people to connect together with other people, with causes, with brands. And the personalization is something that you have a symbiotic way of looking at the organic content so that what users are generating with what is the paid content, which is what the advertisers are paying in order to reach their audience. And this personalization is covering these two aspects uh, of the thing. So how this relates to fairness, which is the second thing. I think we are going to speak about a bit uh, further later on, but let me just uh, share with you initial thoughts. When we think about personalized service or personalized ads, if we want to focus in particular in one part of the activity, we need to examine how this service works because it's not a question of saying personalized ads are fair or unfair. It's how this personalization works in practice. And that's why the elements that we're mentioning, I think in the title and in the comments that Vera has made before, are so important. So how transparency is actually explaining what this personalization means. Is there other fundamental rights that could be at stake and how they have been balanced? Is there any importance that there are user controls or not and how they are accessible? So all of these elements will enable for you or for us, I believe, to assess whether a specific personalization or a specific personalization in ads, if this is the place that you want to assess, is actually fair or unfair. So what I would like to close the remarks is that as it always happens in privacy, everything is about the context. So it's not the same thing the personalized service that Meta serves that the one that Criteo may serve or that one of the real bidding uh, services may serve or that BMW may serve. It's not a question of the personalization but the way in which this personalization is actually conducted. Thank you. Okay, um, so before I um, jump deeper because actually I would like to know much more specifically um, how you think um, the fairness principle is actually implemented uh, uh, at Meta with respect to um, transparency. I mean, uh, we have still a lot of time. I didn't expect that you explained that now, yeah, but I just would like to mention it already now. Uh, so let's jump over um, to David, uh, because David, um, here maybe I start. Um, so you are um, head of data and privacy at Conreri in Hamburg, um, where you are responsible for the data protection business area and acts as an interface and translator between the political, business and legal spheres for your clients. Uh, I know it. Uh, it's a tricky thing, this uh, translation task. Um, and you are considered a proven data protection expert in the media and digital industry, and you have many years of experience in consulting. You are also a lecturer at, um, at a university, um, etc. I would like to mention another thing, because you have, in former times, um, also, I think, involved um, at the... Um, uh, uh, Federal Association in Germany um, of the Digital uh, Economy. And there you have been involved in the so-called uh, PURE model. I don't know how many people of you already know the PURE model, but um, it was heavily discussed, at least in the, in the German debate. Um, and it raised a lot of questions about uh, fairness. And uh, maybe just, David, uh, would you like to quickly explain um, what the pure model actually is and whether you think in how far um, it is fair? Thanks, Max. Glad to be here. Um, pure models are a kind of consent banner where the user have the choice to either give the consent to, to advertising and tracking, for example, or to sus subscribe to a service that allows them to access the website without advertising and tracking. The user have also two paths to get access to the website, consent in advertising and tracking, 
or um, a paid subscription and get access without advertising and tracking. With regard to the fairness, transparency and user control, the BU models raise the question of lawfulness of consent and the extent to which access to a website can be made depend on consent. It is now widely accepted that the forced consent is not permissible without any appropriate alternative, often referred as cookie wall. Somebody of you know this word cookie wall. On the other hand, a model where the user have a choice between consent and an appropriate alternative can be maybe perfectly permissible. This can also be seen in the increasingly frequently implemented pure models in the market and in cross-website poor subscription such as Content Pass. Personally, I think pure models are very fair because the user have a free choice to decide to what extent they want to consume content and services we are personalized advertising and the content or we are paid subscription this approach allows we think media plurality and free access to news and in times like today this is an important foundation for our western democracies so i just would like to um wrap this, uh, this up again why this was so heavily debated in germany because in the end it's about the question is it really fair that um, a user um, has the choice between from the perspective of some data protection authorities Scylla and Charybdis because you can only access the content if you give even your data or you pay with money so this was the, the big question and there I think um, uh, it's also very connected to consent and the um, uh, Freiwilligkeit uh, I'm sorry uh, voluntariness uh, uh, of the consent because is it really voluntarily given the consent um, if uh, 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 if they don't get access uh, to the service anymore and now it's just in another um, term so is it still voluntary if you have to either uh, to give consent or if you don't give it you have to pay to exit uh, uh, access the content so I think it's a very interesting um, also business and ethics related questions however this exactly um, bridges um, uh, our discussion to uh, Giovanni. Uh, so Giovanni, because um, you are um, the PLMJ Chair uh, in Law and Technology at Catholica, a global school of law, and Catholica Lisbon, uh, Lisbon School of Law. So in your research interest, so you are an academic. So, and your um, a research interest deals with constitutional law, human rights, freedom of expression, privacy and data protection law, and uh, further in this respect, um, you are also the author of the monograph, uh, Digital Constitutionalism in Europe, Reframing Rights and Powers in the Algorithmic Society. And I think this is the perfect occasion, occasion to um, broaden our discussion again, so to get a meta perspective after we have a little bit talked about a, what is the meaning of the principle um, um, of the fairness principle within the GDPR, understanding what it means with respect to personalization at meta, um, taking another use case with the pure model in Germany and now expanding across Europe. And now let's take one step back and ask um, Giovanni, it's a tricky question. What do you think? How does personalization actually, how does this affect fundamental rights? And how should it be dealt with with the fairness uh, principle? So let's, let's just um, interconnect this uh, a little bit more with the fundamental rights level. Yep. Thank you so much, Max, for the introduction. And of course, good morning to everybody. Um, I mean, when, when we try to connect fairness and personalization that probably as all of you have understood is actually the subject matter for today, it's not, the, it's not an easy answer for our question. Going back circularly to what Vera was saying at the beginning, you know, when we talk about fairness, one of the big questions about what does really fairness mean, and there is a reason also for fundamental rights directly, you know, also because uh, when we talk about fairness, you know, of course we talk about fairness in the GDPR, but we are not talking about fairness in the GDPR usually, because fairness is a concept that we find in contract law, in constitutional law, we found in sports, we found in, it's a concept that is differently interpreted into society. And you know why? For one simple reason, that sometimes it's so underestimated, you know, in the debate, because fairness is a principle. And a principle by default has no, it's like an empty box. There is no content within a principle. So the question 
is about even the most important question is who actually shapes the content of this box? Who gives the principle of fairness the shape that applies to different contexts? And I'm thinking about it, I'm touching the essence of the GDPR when we talk about accountability and when we talk about even the protection of fundamental rights. Because what we are talking at the end, you know, we're talking about a principle that everyone is discussing. Think about even in the framework of AI. Everyone is talking about AI fairness. But can you find anyone agreeing about what is AI fairness? And it's not different when we talk about the GDPR. And that's why it's so different sometimes to have like a system like the GDPR that tends to protect data subject rights up to a certain point, especially fundamental rights, but at the same time use principles for doing that. And also, so it moves the game, if you want, actually moves, it shifts the perspective from the content of the, from the principle per se to who actually is the one that will interpret this principle. In constitutional democracy, usually we think about courts. We think about uh, DPAs, you know, data protection authorities, and you name what, which other authorities could be competent, say, about what fairness is or should be in a constitutional democracy or in data protection, as you like. But still, we should not forget that in the GDPR, and then I stopped, I promise, one of the most important players in the GDPR is the data controller. And the principle of accountability turns back to the data controller, the role to tell me, to tell the data subject how to interpret and implement the principle of fairness. So when we talk about fairness, usually say, no, this is something for courts. Uh, this is something for, no, it's not really the case. When we look at the GDPR, the notion of fairness is very much shaped by different ways in which data controllers approach general principles. And you know what, last point before, next, before going back to Max, is that even this principle is not always the same implemented by data controllers because sometimes data controllers are public administrations, sometimes are social media, sometimes are e-commerce marketplaces, sometimes are NGOs, you name it. So there are different contexts that differently shape uh, fairness when we talk about fairness. And this, of course, is a big influence and of course I would not say consequence because it's too much but it's a big influence on how we interpret and protect rights and then I do not need to explain to you why this has consequences when we talk about personalization and then I stop here okay <clears throat> thanks a lot um, Giovanni so um, very interesting thanks uh, for setting setting the stage um, actually um, actually for this discussion and now I would like um, to become uh, a little bit more punchy so also, it's not a threat by the way yeah um, uh, but it, it needs to be fair um, and I would like uh, to start with um, a little bit uh, contesting um, what I'm a lawyer, and so I, of course, uh, refer to the lawyers here uh, first. So uh, to contest what you said regarding what a principle actually is and what the fairness principle uh, might mean in the GDPR. And then let's go uh, into the practical consequences. Because um, I think a principle, I mean, it's a legal discussion. It can be everything. But uh, you could also understand it not like a black box or an empty box. I mean, if it's completely empty, uh, then it would be completely useless. So there must be at least a shape yeah, of, a, is it a box or is it a large box or a small box? But there must be also at least a little bit content. And I understood always, after I delved a little bit deeper into it, a principle that it's something like a maximum goal that should be reached by the regulation addressees, so in the terms of the GDPR, by the data controllers, and this is different to the other regulation uh, mechanism, uh, a typical condi conditional norm, a conditional if-then sentence, because a principle only says, hey, this is the maximum you have to reach, but I don't say how you can reach it. Yeah? And then it's interesting that in the GDPR, so it must be fair, and now it's interesting whether the GDPR uh, specifies this uh, with respect, um, like with the other principles, like lawfulness principle is specified in Article 6. And actually, I found that in the GDPR in the intervention rights. So because if you 
if you go back to the other um, uh, pr uh, principle at court, for example, then very often it's about autonomy and the question is the person concer concerned left completely outside of the process which finally um, 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 affects the person. So is there a legal proceeding um, with a hearing of the accused person or is this accused person involved? And I think it's exactly the same thing in the GDPR. So it's not only about transparency. I mean, you can think, uh, uh, make things uh, transparent, but it's more than the fairness principle says, well, and you have to involve um, um, the uh, data subject and you have to give them uh, possibilities to, um, uh, of choice, of um, objection, etc., etc. So if this is the case and you don't um, uh, also, uh, contest this, or maybe let's uh, come uh, to the question, how is it, I had to do this now to specify because now it's easier to ask uh, Cecilia, hey, if we take this now as a possible benchmark, how does um, a meta actually implement uh, uh, this principle? Uh, at, yeah. With respect to personalization. Thank you, Max. I would like to make first a comment in reaction to that fairness always involves user choice. That has nothing to do with meta. There could be a certain number of processes in which I'm thinking in particular when there is a use in period of the state and you pay taxes, in which our user choice is definitely not there, uh, but this doesn't make necessarily that the processing is unfair. So I think that we always need, again, to look at the context. And now I will go to my context, the context of, of Meta, where there is uh, a certain uh, elements regarding the, the user controls. So I may exemplify the way in which Meta has been implementing the fairness uh, principle by using a sentence that was in a newsroom post of, of my boss of the boss. Which was saying, it takes two to tango, in the sense that it takes two elements in order that someone actually can dance in this case. In the ad systems, as I focus in particular, in the ad systems, you have a certain number of elements that have been decisions that the company has been taking without the choice of the user. And there are other elements in which the user choice has been incorporated. This is the two parts of the tango dance. So let's move to try to explain what happens in the meta side of decisions. One of them is the transparency, that we can put it in both sides because it benefits the user, so it involves it, but to explain first in the terms of use what we do. Uh, with the, the personalized experience and the role that it plays with respect to the data. And in particular, second decision, that in this case, personal data are not going to be provided to the advertisers, as opposed to other models in which we have personalized ads and real-time bidding could be one of them. The data are not flowing from meta to the advertisers. What the advertisers receives is the possibility to identify an audience with respect to demographics and interest in order to reach out uh, to the uh, individuals who are Facebook users. But the personal data are not uh, processed. Another decision that the company has been taking is that among the targeting options that the advertiser may choose, they are not going to find sensitive categories of data as defined in the GDPR, which are maybe something that the users may have decided to incorporate in their profile. This doesn't mean, as the case may be, that did not share them in the way they would like to with their friends or others, but this is not used for advertising purposes because this is not part of the things that an advertiser may choose in order to reach an audience. Another thing that is more recent has been the deprecation of what we call sensitive topics. This is not sensitive categories of data. Let me take an example. If you are maybe saying that you like a picture of one of your friends in a marathon raising funds regarding cancer, it doesn't mean that you are a patient of cancer. It doesn't mean that you have an attribute of sensitive categories of data, but you could be interested in marathons and or in cancer for many different reasons. Maybe because you are 
let's say, co considering this as a cause for the society and you feel close to this. Maybe you are a patient, it could happen. Maybe it's a question that happens in your family. So there could be many reasons why you could be interested in cancer, in COVID, even following Trump in an election, not necessarily because you're a Trump follower, so far and so on. But these sensitive issues that are difficult sometimes, this is something that has been decided by the company more recently that it has been deprecated among the targeted options from the advertisers. There are more uh, elements with respect to uh, what happens with the community standards. This is a big decision for the organization that has nothing or has nothing to do now, but it doesn't, it's not specific to the ads. The community standards are the rules that the company decides to identify among the contract with the user of the kind of things that we do not want to have in the platform such as terrorism, such as sexual trafficking, such as hate speech, such as misinformation, such as cyberbullying, or a certain number of elements. And this is something that is enforced through AI and through human review, or through user reporting. But this is something that is going to be part of the enforcement also of the ads, not only of the organic contents. And we have other decisions with respect to the advertising policies. For example, you cannot advertise weapons. You cannot advertise drugs, you cannot advertise, so a certain number of things, or scams, or a certain number of things that are in addition, let's say, to what you have in the community standards. And there is also a library, which is a transparency, not in the sense of GDPR, thinking of the user, but thinking of the advertisers, because they are going to be accountable, because we are going to publish what they do, and the kind of targeting elements that they choose and how much money they have been doing this. This started with political ads at the very beginning in order to give more transparency to the way in which political ads were conducted in the platform. And this has been extended now to any um, advertiser. Let's go to the other part of the tango, the user. There is a decision that was taken also a long time ago that with respect to the data that are uh, obtained from third parties, so outside of the platform and the, these uh, websites or apps are sending to us in principle with the consent of the users according to their legal duties and the contractual impositions that we make. This is in addition put under an opt-in consent for the users in order to come to our uh, salad, let's say, of data that are going to be used for the personalization. In each and every ad and in each and every post, you also have another transparency measure, that is that you understand why you are receiving this. Actually, the name of the tool is why I'm seeing this. Because what you have is a kind of explanation of how the algorithm works in the sense of identify which has been the most important elements, the signals that the company has been taking into account in order for you to see something about dogs as opposed about toothpaste, for example. And this is something that is not only about what you do in the sense that you click all the time in puppies, my case, but what my friends could be doing as well. Because it is understood that if your friends like something and you have something in common with your friends, it could be the case that you like as well something that you share with your friends. And this is part of the logic. But transparency sometimes needs to come with control, which is part also of what we have in the title. So it's not only that you know why you are receiving this, but that you are going to be able to be accessing what we call to the ad preferences. So the kind of interest that the algorithm is predicting about you. In other that, if you consider that this is something either that the algorithm is wrong or that it could be right, but it's not the kind of content that you would like to receive, you go to your ad preferences and you remove the thing. This makes that you are going no longer to receive anything, not necessarily because there are advertisers that are going to choose that they are sending something about toothpaste to any kind of woman between 25 and 35 years old. I will no longer be targeted, I believe, living in Spain, and that's it. And therefore, if it's a toothpaste, yes, I will receive it. But for those who are going to take toothpaste, these will be those that I will not be receiving this. And this is actually something that uh, works um, very well. There are other kind of measures regarding the agency of the user, in particular also the fact that you can delete things, and if you delete things, actually they are no longer informing the algorithm, and this is also something that is uh, powerful. I leave it here, there are more measures, but what I wanted to e explain or exemplify or illustrate is how fairness is understood in the sense of thinking about what the company can do in order to 
address perceived harms or actual harms, and what the user is also participating in defining also the degree of personalization that is going to experience in the platform. Okay. Um, may I ask one question where we go a little bit more um, into detail? You, Cecilia, because, um, okay, I understand what you say, and also, especially with respect, what I found very um, um, important, at least for this panel discussion, with all these intervention and uh, transparency um, options um, at Facebook, for example, yeah, where I looked it up a couple of months ago and I see, ah, this has really changed um, in the last 10 years when I was first uh, using Facebook. So I can really much better control now with whom to share data, um, how does it work, how can I um, um, uh, uh, control um, um, the ads um, algorithm at least a little bit. So. If there are so many options already, uh, what, in your opinion, is then the problem of the data protection authorities which don't stop uh, criticizing? Also, yeah, uh, what's the problem in their, uh, in their opinion? <clears throat> Since I am not the data protection authority that has been assessing us, uh, it's very difficult, so I, I will only be able, let's say, to paraphrase. It's a mean uh, question. Probably uh, what has been said in, in uh, recent decisions. And what we can see first is that there has not been an anonymous decision from the start. So what we have seen is for a certain number of years, uh, that we have been socializing and it's quite public because this is the kind of companies that the terms of use and everything is public and can be looked at. So it has not been any surprise for anyone that uh, the legal basis that was actually the way in which the data protection authorities have been assessing this, not through the fairness lens, but through the legal basis lens, they were addressing the contractual necessity, which is at the core of the reasoning in the sense that you are explaining in the terms of use how personali the personalization service that you are uh, servicing with also the community standard that form parts of this. And therefore, this was logical for us to understand that the performance of the contractual necessity was the legal basis. What you can read in the decision that has taken a lot of time to take because there was what I have understood a lot of discussion among the data protection authorities is that they do not consider that contractual necessity is enough. However, when they read the decision, it doesn't seem that they have read the terms of use, but they are in an ideal logic with respect to what any contract may say. Not our contract, not any of the measures that I mentioned. So there has not been any analysis with respect to the kind of behavioral ads that we have. And I was not thinking about this, but since you have posed me the question, I will not say what the DPS think, because everybody can read the decision, but maybe I can read what the court says. At the time this decision was issued, the only court decision that we had was an Austrian decision from the Court of Appeal in a case involving someone that probably everybody knows in this community. And this Austrian court said, the nature of this Facebook business model and the contractual purposes associated with it from the perspective of the Facebook user above all, gaining access to a personalized communication platform and though tailored advertising without having to pay money for it from the perspective of the defendant in particular, generating income through personalized advertising made possible by the personal data of Facebook users is explained in the terms of, use of service in a way that is easily understandable to any reader who is even moderately attentive. The model is also neither immoral nor unusual. Finally, the control type purposes are clearly illustrated in the overall structure of this set of rules. The processing of personal users' data is a supporting pillar of the contract concluding between the parties. I may go on and on, but this was the starting point 
of the position of the company that was endorsed and supported by the authority that was in charge of monitoring what we do. It was endorsed by the sole court decision that we have at the time the EDPB decision was issued, and then we have the EDPB decision. Okay, I just sum it up because I think it was um, complex, um, and I'm also not sure whether actually I'm doing it right, so I speak it out loudly. So I understand the situation now like that, and then I, I broaden the discussion again. Uh, that I understood it that way, that um, the fairness principle is in some way connected also with the lawfulness principle. And so, um, and I think that the data protection authorities um, say, even if there is fairness implemented within META, on several cases, it's not enough, in their opinion, I don't say it's my opinion, yeah, I just would like to um, point it a little bit more out, and, but it's not enough to make the whole thing lawful. Now I would like well, their opinion, and the court is uh, uh, much um, more um, yeah, liberal there. It's, it's, it's much less strict, um, obviously. So uh, now let's broaden the perspective, and I would like to ask the lawyers again, um, connecting to the pure model, would it be fairer, um, and then maybe even legal, if um, we um, offer um, a paid solution? Um, maybe with respect to Facebook, but not at all. But here, so now again, what do you think, what do the lawyers think, you as a practical lawyer, you as an academic, with respect to um, constitutionalism? Um, so do you think uh, that um, a pay solution um, would make the whole thing fairer, and why? And maybe even, le even legal, as a lawful. I mean, um, there have been uh, already a debate about whether, you know, it's possible to access services, you know, by paying and you do not get ads, you know, there are already services working like that. So it's like being on YouTube or Spotify, you know, you pay and you do not get ads. That's fine. You know, so I'm pretty sure that some of you sometimes pay not to see ads. Even Netflix has talked about that. So many digital actors, you know, have ask you to, have uh, gone through, you know, certain things have, in a sense, shift towards like a, a subscription model in order, or like an ad model in order to, advertise. but this discussion is spreading, you know, it's not anymore about just uh, in the technological sector, because even media outlets, now there is also discussion with media outlets sometimes that they ask you to consent for the processing of data, if you see that this has been always the case in some member states, rather than, for instance, saying, oh, you can actually subscribe yearly and we do not need actually to use your data. So this discussion is there, and this is very much connect to other topics related to data monetization and also other topics that this is not the subject matter for today. But the problem with the personalization, uh, what I wanted to stress, even from a broader perspective, you know, that it's important to take in mind, is always about, when we think about personalization, we're talking about people. So we're talking about rights, but you're talking about freedoms. So on the one hand, we have the entity that provides you a service, of course, that of course enjoys its own market freedoms and so forth. And on the other hand, you have the users that has in a certain sense, some its own protection of rights and it wants personal data and so forth, and the protection of data and privacy and so forth. So, of course, by definition, even if you pay a service, okay, there is still a balance between how you participate in the relationship between the market and democracy. So there is always this relationship going back and forth. And the notion to understand Probably, if you pay for a service, probably, and then I'm wanting to introduce another concept that is in the title, it's a more also balanced approach in the position, in the conflicting position between that exists. I mean, we don't need to recognize that. I mean, it exists in the relationship between market and democracy, between users and you know, providers of services, generally speaking, no matter whether it's a media outlet, it's an e-commerce marketplace, okay? So what is important is that to strike a fair balance in this relationship where we are user, but we are also consumers. Sometimes we are also part of business entities and we also provide services. So we play different roles and different roles, sometimes they overlap, sometimes they clash. And when they clash, you know, the beauty 
of European constitutionalism, it knows about the concept of proportionality. And so this role, and then I stop here because we can talk about, about that, is how to interpret the question of fairness and personalization in a sponsor of that, if you want to pay, in terms of saying this is fairer because if you know that you are paying for accessing a service and you don't get ads, always you are not, the per degree of personalization is definitely lower, you know, in up to a certain point. Instead of using actually your data for other reasons because you are not paying for that service. You can argue this way, for instance, you know, but there is not a single solution. Of course, the paid subscription model could be a solution to strike a fair balance, but it's not the only one because for some probably business actors, it could not be profitable, could not be useful to go for like a, for a subscription model. And also probably because sometimes also users do not see the reason why they should pay to use like a service that they were not paying like until last week. Maybe first, uh, Vera, and then you got it. Thank you. Um, I would like to make clear that we are discussing private economy here and not data processing by public bodies. I think different rules would apply to public bodies, but in the private sector, so in the private economy, I think that no company can be obliged to offer a service for free. Yeah. So um, any choice that the company gives to the users in the first step is a, a question of how the business model is constructed, yeah? how, how the business is built, how, how it works. And that's in the first place, I would say, a free choice. And then the user or the consumer also has a choice to use that service or not use that service. I would say there can be one exception for those services that are really a single, a single source, a sort of a monopoly service, um, which cannot be obtained through, uh, through a different provider. And, and there, perhaps, different rules may apply. But in the, in the general private economy, where you have um, a functioning market, a service cannot be for free. And then the question is, how you pay for it, and you can pay for it in, in different manners. You can pay it by money, uh, or by a counter service, or perhaps also by providi providing data. And I think that should, that should guide our discussion. So the question whether it's fair to offer a, a, a service that is paid, or a service that is paid for by data, leaves the individual a choice, first between these two options, and then also the choice of not taking the service. Yeah, and I think we, we, we need to, to bear this in mind. I think it's important to note that the pure models represent an opportunity to harmonize the interest of the users and also the interests of the service or content provider in accordance with the law, and that's important, I think. Pure models are an approach um, by the business community to commercialize their offering in a legally secure, economical, feasible, and fair manner and consumer understand the option to go with a poor model, yes or no to tracking um, free content and services with advertising and tracking or paid a poor subscription. I think it's a very fair approach for all stakeholders and also its lawfulness. We see in the moment also the German Data Protection Conference, the French authority, the CNIL, and also a decision in Austria um, about the standard and Max Schrems organization, NOIP. Um, nobody say pure models are don't allow. They all say it's possible to do that. We need to look at different criteria. For example, the alternative, is it's fair and how we can look at it if it's fair. It's the price, maybe. It's the user, they choose this way. It's maybe the granularity that it's not only two ways, but also to take some purposes, yes or no. And that, these are the questions, not if it allowed that the media or service provider think about how he can get money for his business model. And, and then the fairness principle, I think, informs any of these options. Yes, yeah? so the fairness is relevant if it's consent-based, 
but it's also relevant if it's contract-based or also on the basis of legitimate interest. Yeah? So in all, or, or there may be additional legal grounds, but I think the fairness principle in, uh, helps interpreting the lawfulness requirements for all these options. I mean, there are two also, interesting also, uh, questions uh, popping up in my mind um, when I'm listening to you, because, um, okay, uh, if I, as a user, if I have the choice um, using, for example, a newspaper without being tracked, yeah, without personalization, then the fairness principle says, hey, Max, you get a choice. And now there are two options. First, either I find, I find the same or the similar content by another provider, yeah, maybe, yeah, so I can simply switch the service, which do, do not track me or whatever, or I pay a price. So I pay with money. And um, so in the newspaper um, business or in the news business, I think this is what has actually been the case um, in the analog world or analog times. I mean, there was a, it was a matter of fact that I had to pay uh, for the newspaper. So we just go back there. I, I, I am just brainstorming. But is this really the same case, Vera? Um, if you have a huge network, a social network, or a huge platform, it's not only concerning Meta, I think. It's also the problem with each net, uh, platform with social network effects. Uh, because there, the question is, can I really go to another service? So do I still reach my friends there, my business network, etc.? And this is um, an interesting question, in my uh, opinion. Is this really a fair choice, then? I think it's important to stress, as you said, that in the analog world, um, a lot of services are not for free yet. For example, if I may, using a toilet in a restaurant or in a cafe um, is free for customers usually, but it's not free for any passer or any um, person that passes by. And if um, and sometimes you you witness that that if someone passes by would like to go to the toilet, then then the service personnel gets very upset because um, it's a service for the customers and not a free service to everyone, and it's easily understandable. Yes. Yeah? So I think in the internet world um, we have become used to a lot of services being for free because this is how the the internet um, also started, um, but. It's not. It's not a given. Yeah. So, and any company, I think, can 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 make that choice not to offer the service for free. Um, of course, for social media or other services that are wildly used, um, there is a the question: Are they so dominant that that the rules on on the, the, the cartel law, the antitrust rules, should apply? So, people should not, or these companies should not abuse of their market power and I think that's that's right and fair but um, is there abuse I mean abuse I think we all agree that there should be no abuse but whether or not there is abuse is a high hurdle and just because a, a service is not for free does not use does not sorry does not mean that you abuse of your dominant position I think um, that a service is paid for, even by data, um, that is, I would say, in the in the in the private economy of the Western world, quite quite a usual thing. Okay. So um, let's, uh, Cecilia, you also wanted um, to uh, add, uh, just uh, already as a um, mental preparation for the audience. I think we are right at the point uh, where I think at least we. Um, explored the complexity of the subject matter, so fairness in personalization and um, personalization-driven economies. And we will open up now the discussion to the audience. Um, so just already think about it. Um, Cecilia, uh, Cecilia, what would you like um, I would to like add to there? I would like to make uh, three comments. Um, it seems as if, if you are not a Meta or a Facebook user, apparently you are not communicating with the world. Well, this maybe comes from the perception of the success of the social media, but I can assure you that people can still communicate despite the fact of not being at Facebook. I even have friends who do not have a Facebook account, and surprise, surprise, we continue to be friends. So we should also uh, think 
uh, also with a, a certain common sense or respect to the fact of, of, of how, let's say, we can communicate. And it's not only a question of communication, but let's move to this communication. One thing that is, I think, lacking in, in the way the question was posed is the lack of balance between fundamental rights. What META does is to facilitate, among others, the fundamental right of expression, the fundamental right of reunion in a certain place, the fundamental right of get information and to share it. I'm not saying that this means that you can do whatever you want. What I'm saying is that it's part of the assessment as well. And the fact that it's for free is not that it's paid by data. It's paid by the advertisers who put money, it's real money, <laughs> that is put in the system. And the fact that it is free, it enables also more inclusion. One of the things that for me was particularly I didn't think about this before I joined Meta, is the importance of the freedom wars in particular in regions that are not as wealthy as we are. Sometimes we think, and it's normal, because we think about our own experience, but when we think in many countries in the world that they do not have any other channel to express themselves because of the money, because of the infrastructure, or because there is no an alternative, but not in the sense that we were speaking that we cannot uh, speak with other friends through other uh, ways. In autocracies, this is definitely another thing as well. Or the way in which people do business. There are a lot of shops and people actually use this in order to reach to the audience. Many creators, many, most of the clients are small and medium enterprises. So the, the figures that I showed you before are, are, are for, for a reason, so that, and that's why it is so successful. Because before what you had, the TV and the radio, that was pretty expensive and with a very small amount of places in which you could put an ad. Meta, among others, is not the only platform, but it has participated to enable that you are able to find for a, a less amount of money an amount of places in which you can reach your audience that is not comparable with what we have before. So we need to think about this also when we think about the alternatives that we have. And the last point, we have had a very important discussion from an antitrust point of view regarding the DSA that has closed. And I can assure you that we were in the minds of the regulators for sure in the DSA. And what has been the result? The result has not been let's ban personalized ads knowing the business model that exists right now. The result has been, let's focus on what we think could be the harms. And they have identified minors, they have identified sensitive categories of data, and they identified political ads that they decided to put in another discussion for other reasons. That is also part of another file. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have, I think, at least two questions from the audience uh, there and there. I don't know who was first, actually. Um, shall we? Um, you? Okay. So uh, first, um, you, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, Katarzyna Szymilewicz, Panopticon Foundation, also European Digital Rights. I have two questions to Meta. One uh, concerning uh, personalized advertising. Uh, does Meta have an idea how to solve the ad delivery problem? So we know that targeting cannot be done based on sensitive data, we know this, but we also know from vast amount of research that sensitive characteristics are de facto detected by AI you use to deliver ads and people are de facto targeted uh, based on their behavioral patterns that do reveal sensitive data, so how to solve this second part of the targeting process. Will that mean that Meta will no longer use uh, AI um, for ad delivery? It will be, for example, random. So what's the solution for this? A second question concerning DSA risk assessments process is how you plan to engage uh, stakeholders uh, in your risk assessments, including on the problem I just described. Thank you. Maybe, um, I don't know, Cecilia, I think this question um, uh, goes to you, but maybe it makes sense to first ask you um, for your question, and then uh, we can um, restructure or maybe uh, answer both questions at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, hi, I'm Arjon Dunnewind, organizer of uh, Impact, a media arts organization, also organizer of Code, a project to reclaim our digital rights. I found several things that um, Cecilia said very problematic, maybe even false. Um, I mean, two times you said users don't pay, they do pay. With that data, this data has great value. Um, your company, Mark Zuckerberg, is one of the richest companies in the world. So that is thanks to the data um, that your users pay um, and the money, uh, the value that this data represents. Um, you made another comparison about um, the user, the agreement between you and the users being fair, comparing it with um, um, governments and tax situations. Well, you're not a government, and that's the big difference. So you need to look at the agreement that you have with your users in a different way. And I think the most important thing is, except for the transparency of the agreement between your users and your company, which is not transparent enough, maybe getting better, but we're not there, the question is, who determines this agreement? Um, and I think it should not be Meta. It should be our government, it should be us, who, have, who are setting up basic agreements um, that you as a company need to apply to, and that safeguard our interest as users. So um, we don't need to agree to your terms and your conditions. It's time that you start agreeing to our terms and our conditions. Um, I would propose, because before it gets too complex, and um, first, let's answer, try to answer these f uh, two questions. We still have time to get to your question, too. Right. Uh, let's go by order. Uh, with respect to your question, I really I think that maybe your starting point is not necessarily right, or at least as far as I understand how the system works. So the way in which the targeted advertising is delivered is how the advertisers actually are able to choose the options in order to reach to this audience. And as I have explained, through the years, the company has taken a certain of decisions. One of them was to do uh, the first one, very long time ago before I joined Meta, with respect to the non-users or sensitive categories of data that were in the profile of the users, but the others is the result of the AI that you mentioned. So the ad preferences are the interests, and when they are related to sensitive issues, that is not exactly the same that sensitive categories of data, but it's the closest thing that we have, because there is not an attribution, there is not a profile that is made through sensitive categories of data of user. This is not made. It doesn't work like this. Well, the, does, and maybe can one? the process will prove this, because there is vast amount of case studies research available showing what? exactly this effect. So well, we do encourage uh, Meta to you confront your opinion about this process with real data in the real world. Well, uh, maybe you know better than myself how Meta works, which is excellent. With respect to the users that do not pay with the data, is I know that it is very common to say that data is the new oil, and this, I think, has been not very fortunate. But the money is coming from the advertisers. I am not... It's valuable, and your service is valuable because you have the data of the users. So the users yes. do pay via that data. I am not stop saying telling the that users don't pay. Second thing that when I mentioned the tax thing, it has nothing to do with the personalized ad. As I mentioned, it was a technical discussion with respect to that when you assess fairness, it is not always including the user choice in certain situations. That actually is not the one of Meta. So it has nothing to do, so I'm so sorry that you have, or I have maybe not expressed myself sufficiently well in order that this was not understood. Regarding the fact that the government defines our agreement, this is uh, something that uh, is quite surprising in a democracy. There is a fundamental right that also exists in the Charter, which is the right to establish a business, which also encompasses how you define an agreement. The way in which legislation enables, let's say, to have certain directions is establishing certain rules with respect to what certain agreements should surpass us. No, there are rules of antitrust, there are rules of consumer law, there are rules of data protection. This works in any kind of service, and Meta is not a different service that needs to be regulated the same way, I believe. You answer, you answer that license question, maybe, and then you. <laughs> 
Yeah, perhaps in the same sense, I think uh, terms of use of private companies are terms of use of a private company. They should not come from the state. Um, I have to obey to the Euro European regulations, exhaustion, safety. We need to develop the same standards for any kind of company, and they need to um, make their products under the terms and conditions of Europe. It's, it's a no-brainer. Come on. You cannot put a car on the roads in Europe that, that uh, doesn't, um, it doesn't um, fit the safety rules of, um, of the, the national government and increasingly of the European governments that agree on these standards. And we need to develop these standards also for a social media company like Facebook. Yes, indeed. So product security rules, for example, are state rules, but the terms of use of a, a car seller, for example, or the, the, of a uh, car rental company, they are private instruments, yeah? Um, the GDPR and other data rules are rules for the processing of data that are public rules, but then the terms of use of a company, these are private, and I think we, we should keep them distinguished, yeah? And I don't think it's uh, fair. It's not actually how our economy works. That, that the state interferes in the contract making or the terms of use of a, of a service provider and a service user. I don't think that is appropriate. It's not fair, I think. But we should perhaps go to the other question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, my name is Sofia Gnatidou, and I'm leading AI policy for the ICO, the UK Data Protection Authority. And we recently published guidance on the principle of fairness in data protection, and more specifically in the AI context, which may be useful, uh, where we outlined that fairness is an overarching principle and not kind of like a right to be traded over something else. It's basically one of the things that underpin the framework uh, that may be useful. And it's also about outcomes and not just about process. Uh, but I'm going to just go to my question, and it's not directed to Meta specifically. It's like a broader question, whoever in the panel wants to answer it is um, I'm just wondering to what extent, uh, when you're thinking about fairness and personalization, uh, how does the information imbalance kind of like uh, factors in, into your thinking? Because what we consider fair, sometimes it's, it's relational as well. It's not just uh, me being aware of what I'm being targeted, targeted with. It's also about me being aware uh, what other people are seeing compared to me, if that makes sense. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just wondering to what extent you see any kind of like, you know, maybe tension between personalization and those kind of like aspects of fairness. Thank you. Um, can I say something, you know, because um, I think that another thing that has not been addressed today, you know, and but it's quite... It's, it must be, uh, sorry, but it must be the final short. answer. Uh, no, no, because no, 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 it's super short, you know, because every time we talk about personalization, you know, we fail to miss, you know, there is a big connection that we have not underlined here between uh, content and data, you know, because every time we talk about data protection, we talk about levelness to treat the data that then will be used for delivering ads or whatever, you know, so, but at the same time, we're talking about content. So the content the users, of course, publish online, the content that they are delivered, and then they are processed because also content are relevant here. And sometimes the information, so we move sometimes from the framework of data and the processing of data, as you said, to the processing also of, of to the area of content and the content that users are exposed to. So so we move even to AI, we move even to the, also, if we want, we can even speak about the framework of the AI Act. So I agree in the sense that the idea of fairness, of course, it's an overarching idea. You know, indeed, we started with that. That's, that's clear. But the important point that I believe that is clear, you know, in order to understand which ads you get in terms of also in deciding how fairness works, it depends very much on a contextual basis. You know, that's very true, you know, that, that as also Max was saying, there is a still a limit in understanding what fairness is. There is like a, a roof, but the, the problem is that how, how also, I mean, the boundaries uh, of that are very much often sometimes defined ex ante, but who is governing actually the space where these ads go on, then it goes to the data protection authority, to the ICO, then it goes to courts, they go to different actors shaping what, what is actually this idea of fairness in different contexts. So the answer is actually, sorry for that, that is very difficult to give you just a single answer to a contextual problem, sorry for that. Yeah, I think it's nice that we um, stop with that answer because it actually shows um, 
Also, in my opinion, it was really interesting because we could at least explore a little bit the complexity of the subject matter and clarify meanings of the terms and also where we stand now. But we could also see um, the demarcation lines um, for the future discussion. And this is one of them, um, uh, I think. So, unfortunately, we have to stop now here because the next panelists are already waiting. Uh, thank you so much um, for your attendance, and I hope you liked it too. <laughs>